Welcome to Clockworks, a Legion podcast. I'm Paul Moffat. I'm Jan Moffat. And we're talking about supplemental extra material this week, which is Deadpool 2. Listen, I know we kind of promised that we would be updating more often than we are, but like, we've been so busy that I feel like I've been dead on my feet. Dead pool oh. on my feet. <laughs> Uh-huh. I was wondering whether there would be a pun, and then you just kind of launched into it. <laughs> Do we want to say right away why we're talking about Deadpool? Too? Go ahead. So, you may wonder why, of all things, we're talking about Deadpool 2, when we haven't talked about Deadpool 1, um, in a context of talking about Legion. It is for one reason, and one reason only. There is a child actor named Luke Rossler, who plays young David in Legion, and who has a little blink-and-you'll-miss-it role in Deadpool. There certainly is. Now, like, there's actually reasons why we might want to talk about Deadpool anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's another X-Men adjacent show that isn't exact, or uh, property, that isn't exactly X-Men, but is connected to it. And also, there is a surreal uh, sense to both Deadpool movies mm-hmm. that takes it differently in its tone and and does different things from Le- Legion, but it's not totally dissimilar. But that said, we wouldn't be talking about Deadpool 2 if Luke Rossler wasn't in it. That's why we didn't talk about Deadpool 1. Do you think... Before we do you want to get into the whole uh, summary of the show, or do you want to speculate about Luke Rossler right now? Let's speculate about that first, and then we'll get into this completely spoiled discussion. So do you think Luke Rossler is playing a young David in this movie? Well, okay, he's at an orphanage for young mutants, and so that's not David's backstory. No. As far as we know. No. I mean, like, we know that it isn't. Yeah. It's we not know just that as it's, far as we know. Yeah. It's not David's backstory. However, we have seen within Legion this whole uh, David in all these multiple different universes thing. We have. And so what I believe about this young, uh, young David within the world of Deadpool 2 is... This is an alternate, an alternate world of David, because so he, especially because Professor X is around and is, well, no, I guess Professor X is a, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> we have a flash in Deadpool two of Professor X, and it's, uh, is it Patrick Stewart Professor X? Yeah, but I think it's Patrick Stewart, not James McAvoy. Oh, I thought it was the opposite. Rewatch. I don't know. It happened too quick. <laughs> I totally agree with your theory, though. This yeah. is David. It is not David in the Legion universe. But both Deadpool and Legion are very comfortable with, like, alternate universe, alternate version, parallel world uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. It makes a lot of sense. Or it's the kind of thing that Deadpool would do to... Uh, make that kind of meta reference on purpose. Mm-hmm. And it's the kind of thing that fits in Legion perfectly that, like, this is an alternate past for David Holler in this reality. He's at a orphanage for mutant youngsters mm-hmm. instead of uh, adopted by Amy's parents. So, yeah, I think it's totally David. Head cannon accepted. All right. Well, that out of the way, let's get into the movie itself. We should just remember that we also decided that canonically the live action Beauty and the Beast is also <laughs> David. Remember? Did we? <laughs> we did. I don't remember exactly agreeing to that. We decided it was a dream sequence. Okay, carry on. <laughs> Everything comes full circle. Um, All right, yeah, so let's get into the movie itself. 
Uh, we're going full on spoilers, so if you haven't seen Deadpool 2, there's your warning. So, Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool, has been working as a mercenary and living with his girlfriend Vanessa. When, he, when his enemies attack him in his home, they accidentally kill Vanessa, and Deadpool, distraught, blows himself up, but survives anyway and re is reassembled by Colossus in the X-Mansion. He agrees to join the X-Men, but ends up disagreeing with their methods when they try to rescue a young mutant. He sees that the orphanage he has been in is abusive and kills one of the guards. Deadpool is taken away to prison along with Russell, the young mutant, who is able to produce fire. So. This beginning part is just beautifully heavy-handed. Oh, yes? Like, there's, I mean, Deadpool is all about this hilarious meta, break the fourth wall, all sorts of things. And so they have him, like, we're celebrating our anniversary. Let's decide to have a baby. Let's, like, check all the boxes to make it as tragic as possible when Vanessa dies. Yeah. And they even, like, keep mentioning fridges. Yes, that too. Lucky I didn't shoot you in the, the wall, the refrigerator. Oh, Rule two: Label everything in the refrigerator. Wait. Ah, uh, and if you're unaware, like there is a cliche, a trope called women in refrigerators, where a woman is killed. Uh, to motivate the action of the main character, which is what happens to Vanessa in this movie. Mm. Uh, and it's they... based on an essay written by Gail Simone. Yeah. So the, like, right around when Vanessa dies, they keep mentioning refrigerators, mm -hmm. like, a couple of times. Yeah, I think that's on purpose. It actually, the movie starts with uh, Deadpool blowing himself up, and then it goes back. And mm -hmm. so I was surprised at how early in the movie that happens you thought that was going to be like the, the end of the movie and the last uh, act yeah exactly which is kind of the first deadpool movie had like wonky order of storytelling but mm -hmm. one like where we started was quite near the end of the movie yeah and then we got caught up to it and then the second one where we started is pretty early in the movie we get caught up with it pretty quickly yeah and of course because like he blows himself up in a way that would kill literally everybody else. Yeah. But he survives because he can't die. Apparently. Because he's Deadpool. Because he's Deadpool. Our usual shtick here on Clockworks is to talk about symbolism and, like, unpack all the meanings of what everything is happening. A lot of what happens in Deadpool is uh, comedic. Mm -hmm. So to, like, unpack it uh, gets, I think, a little boring. That, like, you know, he is a parody. Deadpool from the beginning was halfway a parody of uh, Wolverine. Mm -hmm. And so he makes references to Wolverine and to uh, Hugh Jackman. And, like, I don't know what how to dig into that more deeply than, like, he's, as Deadpool always is, uh, lampooning the tropes and cliches of the uh, medium that he's in. Mm -hmm. So the dead girlfriend and the, like, tortured uh, anti-hero that, like, he bounces quickly from being a tortured anti-hero to, like, not caring again mm -hmm. because that's his shtick. Yeah. You know? The thing maybe that, that I might... That we might have something to say is about Russell and that whole deal. Yeah, exactly. What do we think about him at this point in the movie? Well, Russell, when he's first introduced, uh, definitely reminds me of David in that he seems to have be a powerful mutant with no control over his power. Mm -hmm. Or he's struggling with control over his power. There's a similar central theme around Russell that, like, what is appropriate for well how is the what's the appropriate way to react to someone whose power is beyond his maturity mm -hmm. which is kind of a sub theme in season one but becomes a more major theme in season two of legion or maybe it's a major theme in season one also mm -hmm. that like russell 
has this power and not this responsibility and in some ways Deadpool does too that there's a uh, parallel also between Russell and Deadpool because they are both they're also both characters whose power is greater than their responsibility and Mm -hmm. in Deadpool's case that's all played for laughs Uh, and in Russell's case not as much Mm -hmm. and Russell has the added uh abuse to to his power and so what uh much like david when you take someone who's very powerful and add on top of that mental distress and mental health problems then you get a toxic combination Mm -hmm. of someone who can't handle their power and is is in unstable i thought the abusive orphanage was a little much hmm or like by much, I just maybe I mean it was a little tired. Hmm. Yeah. Ah. It's a lot of heavy handedness in this it movie, is. and it's on purpose. But it's also it's still there as heavy handedness. So you have the orphanage that is very much modeled on the uh, cure your gay away or whatever, yeah. Like camps that kids are sent to to cure their homosexuality, and so this. Is a, it's a bit tired to have that metaphor, but also, it's also, I don't know, yeah. highlighting it. Like, it's true. It's a bit tired, but it's also, like, important to the X-Men and central to, like, what the X-Men is about is, uh, it's a metaphor for all kinds of socially persecuted groups. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's a mistake when the X-Men strays from that. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah. So Russell and Deadpool are given power suppression collars and put in a prison for mutants. The prison is attacked by Cable, a mutant from the future. Cable is looking for Russell because Russell will grow up and kill Cable's family. Deadpool manages to help him and escape the prison, but Russell is left behind. Deadpool organizes the X-Force to rescue Russell from the transfer convoy, but they are all killed except for Domino. Right. <laughs> the convoy is destroyed by Juggernaut, and Russell and Juggernaut team up and escape together. I have to just talk a second about the team up, the X Force, mm-hmm. and them all dying immediately. I wasn't spoiled on that when we watched this movie. No, nope, me neither. I knew, I had heard that, like, Domino is great, and I hadn't heard that the rest of them were great. Like, I hadn't heard much about them. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't spoiled on that, and I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> and, like, we are spoiling in this podcast, so I assume you all know. But, like, they all die due to the high winds, one after another, like, gruesomely. Yeah. It's really funny. Especially Terry. I was Terry Crews is like a name actor who I really recognized and love from from his other work. And then like, oh no, he really dies too. He's just dead. Yeah. Yeah. It turns out that was like a very brief cameo. Yeah. Exactly. I thought so, that was really great. <laughs> that was yeah. That was really funny and really great. And I mean, Domino and her whole deal is fantastic. All of the the whole sequence of her just like avoiding being killed and yep. everything working out is such a cool way of showing that power. Yeah, absolutely. I had heard going into the movie that Domino was really good and like it it uh lived up to the hype that I'd heard. I thought she was so entertaining and so cool mm-hmm. and so fun. Um to back up a little bit though yeah there's another like connection to legion here in that uh cable traveling back to the past to stop a thing from happening in the future is again the like russell is like david yes. cable is sid mm-hmm. <laughs> or something like tra- there's all this time travel loopiness in this movie that's not as convoluted as it is in legion But it's the same basic idea that they travel back to prevent someone who's not yet a villain from becoming a villain. And the, like, moral question inherent in that is still present in this movie. Treated less, you know, treated more simply. 
mm-hmm. uh, more simplistically, but still present, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like Cable as a character to come in like this and to prevent Russell from killing his family, he's going to kill Russell. But there's that whole time travel loopness where if he kills Russell, he won't have been sent back in time to kill Russell. Yeah. So how does that even work out in the end? And it never does in this movie. <laughs> nope. It's not that kind of time travel, I guess. I guess. I guess I... It's, the, it's the kind of time travel with multiple worlds, which is what we just speculated with uh, the yeah. tiny David. So that works, I guess. And that's always a thing with Cable, right? He's mm-hmm. a time traveler who goes back to do stuff. And then sometimes he goes back to the future and finds everything has changed. And he's like, no, I accidentally made it worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he's very tortured. <laughs> so Cable is Jean Grey and Cyclops' son? Yes. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, comics. <laughs> and if, in the... In here in Deadpool, he has like his mutant powers a bit. Mm-hmm. In the comics, he's very inconsistent mm-hmm. what his mutant powers are and how strong they are. Sometimes he like basically doesn't have any, just shoots things. And sometimes he's like the most powerful mutant that has ever existed. And it's just like, eh. <laughs> yeah. In the '90s X Men cartoon, that was my first introduction to Cable. He, like, I think uses telekinesis once, mm. and the rest of the time has a weird glowing eye and shoots stuff with a gun. Uh, which is, in this movie, he, like, whenever his guns are out of reach, he mentally brings them to him, and he prevents harm to himself by making, like, psychic shields. Mm-hmm. So that's his deal. That's his deal. Usually he's also telepathic. Yes. In the comics. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, maybe not usually, Sometimes. Hmm. usually he is telepathic but he doesn't use that power (laughs) because why would you why would you goodness so the juggernaut showing up too was a lot of fun he's just huge and you get this ominous sense of something is coming something is coming this rattling on the on the train and i was like i'm guessing that's juggernaut and then sure enough yep it sure is I thought it was going to be Killer Croc. Killer Croc is DC. So is Juggernaut. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so is Thanos. He's in this movie. No, Thanos is, is Marvel. Thanos is also Marvel. <laughs> Stop talking like you know anything about comics, Paul. It, I hope it's clear that I'm being deliberately obnoxious. <laughs> I'm actually, obviously, no the difference Mm -hmm. so russell and juggernaut go to attack the orphanage and kill the headmaster Mm -hmm. deadpool domino colossus negasonic teenage warhead yukio (laughs) and his other non-powered friends team up with cable to stop russell deadpool is going to talk to him so the future doesn't happen cable is going to kill him so the future doesn't happen right they fight the juggernaut or is it the juggernaut or just juggernaut? Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they fight at the juggernaut and Cable attempts to shoot Russell. Deadpool jumps in front of the bullet while wearing the suppression collar. He dies for Russell, preventing Russell from going evil. Cable uses the last of his time travel energy to save Deadpool's life. Dupinder... Deadpool's taxi driving friend kills the headmaster by hitting him with his car. <laughs> and then there's like an epilogue where Deadpool travels back in time and prevents all this from ever happening by saving Vanessa's life and mm-hmm. then prevents it from ha- prevents Ryan Reynolds from ever being in Green Lantern and then prevents you know all kinds of things. Yeah, the old uh, he kills the Deadpool from the X-Men <laughs> right. movie because that's a terrible movie. Yeah. Yeah. So like again I feel like the most tangled uh, thing about this section is all the time travel loopiness. And even that, I don't know that it is that tangled. I thought I'd have more to say about Deadpool, honestly. When we're Mm -hmm. sitting down to talk about it, I'm like, it was funny. There's things I can say I liked about it. The uh, complexity, there's not a 
ton of complexity here. Do you think I'm wrong? I don't think you're wrong. I think that uh, there's some things to talk about in terms of Deadpool is traveling to visit his dead girlfriend all the time in his dreams. Mm -hmm. And her message to him is really unclear. And like, is it that she has a message for him or is it that that's all in his head and he just wants to be with her? I kind of think that it's all in his head. Mm -hmm. I don't think that she's speaking to him from beyond the grave, Uh, especially because her message to him, the words of her message to him is that his heart isn't in the right place. And like that doesn't end up clearly meaning anything. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it makes more sense to me that that is his kind of conscience speaking to himself. Mm. And like, just in terms of, of, is is this a universe that has ghosts? Is this a universe that has, she just has no mutant powers. Like, mm. uh, supernatural or unexplained things in this universe are mutants. Uh, she's not a mutant, and his mutant powers don't involve anything psychic. So, like, how is he having psychic dreams? Right. But it makes a lot of sense that his, you know, his uh, flippancy is played in this movie and sometimes in the comics, too, as, uh, you know, a defense mechanism that there Mm. is an actual uh, emotionally nuanced person beneath that flippancy, certainly in the movie. And then in his dreams, he's reprimanding himself for not being con- emotionally connected to himself. Right, yeah. Right? So that all his, like, jokes and flippancy and... Uh, I keep saying flippancy a hundred times, but, you know, his... Uh, flippancy? Flippancy. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> his smart acidness is a defense mechanism that doesn't work on himself mm-hmm. anymore. And that's what is actually meant by your heart isn't in the right place. It's not a secret code from beyond the grave of how to save Russell's life. It is himself understanding uh, that smart acidly acidry aside, he needs to be a genuine person sometimes if he's going to exist. And that is ends up what he ends up doing. So he sacrifices himself. Right. The whole movie. Yeah. The whole movie is actually uh, about Deadpool's emotional growth and learning to be emotionally genuine sometimes. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I agree. That is what it is. And that's what saves Russell, and that's what also would have saved David. <laughs> to take it back to Legion. Yeah. That, like, people, including David himself, but uh, including the people who are on David's side are not emotionally genuine with him. Mm-hmm. Even Sid. Sid from the future, that is, certainly. Yeah. Is like... Everyone's too scared of him to be genuine. Mm-hmm. And he recognizes that. And that's kind of what has happened with Deadpool in the movie... And it's kind of what has happened with Russell in the movie. Mm-hmm. And what changes Russell is um, Deadpool's emotional... Like, sacrificing himself, but that is just putting in practice an emotional connection. Mm-hmm. And what allows Deadpool to do that is an emotional connection within himself, to himself. And then, like, it's all about uh, being real... Deadpool is all about being real in the end. In the in the end, even though it is the most uh, fourth wall, breaky, make fun of everything kind of a movie. Yeah. So in the end, it's giving, it's giving us the message that that's not necessarily a good thing. Well, it's giving us the message that that's what we should be laughing at. Yeah. Interesting. I think so. I didn't really like D- Juggernaut in this movie that much, by the no? way. I thought he was kind of funny. The, I like, thought he was kind of funny. Villain. I, like, maybe I'm taking it in the wrong spirit, but I thought that he uh, 
was misrepresented. <laughs> mm, yes, probably. <laughs> what exactly his powers are and even his character, I think, were misrepresented in the movie. And I kind of was like, they just made him a big mindless Hulk smash. Mm. When, like, the Juggernaut's power specifically is that uh, once he sets his mind to go some, to move in a direction, uh, nothing physical or psychic is pa- powerful enough to stop him. Mm-hmm. He's really strong, but he's fundamentally about, I'm going to go in this direction. And they don't play on that at all. Yeah, that's a good call. So I was kind of disappointed in that, Mm -hmm. honestly. When the reveal that, like, the monster in the cage was Juggernaut, I was good with that. But then that, like, his deal is that he goes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right? And he didn't go in this And he didn't go. Yeah, you're right. I was a little disappointed. Yeah. By that. Anything else that we want to, like, talk about in terms of Deadpool? Connections to Legion or just stuff about Deadpool? What was your favorite thing? What was my favorite thing? Oh, so many things were hilarious in this movie. I don't expect to like Deadpool and then I actually like it. (laughs) It's my main (laughs) thing. I don't expect that I'm going to like this kind of movie. But then, um, I mean, there's a few things that of aspects that I like about Deadpool in general that are like when his legs get shot off, when he is completely in half, the way to get him back together is not to like stick his two halves back together, but that he has to grow a whole nother set of legs. And so for a while he just like has tiny baby legs. <laughs> that That is so not what I would have uh, picked out as one of my favorite <laughs> moments at all. But also... There's Domino and her, like, the way they show her luck and her way her, like, avoiding everything through luck is fantastically done. Yeah. What was, what's, (laughs) you're surprised that that would be my favorite, a favorite thing of mine? Yeah. That was (laughs) fine, but like. It's just an aspect of Deadpool I find really interesting and really, like, well done. I really like Domino's whole deal. Mm -hmm. I really, like, the part that made me laugh the most was the part that I was most surprised by, which is all of X-Force being, like, gruesomely killed. Yes. Made me laugh really hard. Yeah. I like, uh, again, this is, like, boringly predictable, but I like uh, his fourth wall breaking. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, Ryan Reynolds jokes, Mm -hmm. uh, I think, are actually pretty funny. Yeah, absolutely. But specific moments in this movie that I liked are the way that all of X-Force dies, and then Deadpool's, I mean, and then Domino's awesomeness Mm -hmm. were my favorite parts. Yeah. So we would love to hear about your favorite parts of Deadpool 2, whether you think it connects to Legion, any theories you have about the young David, if you agree with ours or disagree or whatever. (laughs) We kind of both have the same theory, so it's yeah. kind of lame. No yeah. debate there. <laughs> True. Disappointing. Um, if you want to talk to us, you can do that on Twitter at ClockworksCast. You can email us, ClockworksCast at gmail.com. And if you like our little in-between season thingamabobbers, the reason why we can do them is patrons on our Patreon website, patreon.com slash clockworkscast, Mm -hmm. where several people support us, and you could be one too, for as little as $1 per month. And it would make us do, be able to do more and exciting things. So thanks for joining us to listen about Deadpool (laughs) 2. The Deadpooling. Did you hear... That they're making a PG version of this movie that's like not has a frame narrative of Deadpool reading the story of this movie to Fred Savage in bed dressed like the kid from uh, uh, The Princess Bride. And it's like going to be PG 13ified and apparently with new material added. And also possibly going to be released under the title The Deadpool Before Christmas. I love it. I think that sounds like a great idea, and I probably will see it if they do that. Probably not in theaters, though.
probably not in theaters. <laughs> All right. Well, I've been Paul Moffat. I've been Jan Moffat. Goodbye. <laughs>